Welcome to our noon edition of Arirang News. Here are the stories making the headlines at this hour. South Korea's second military reconnaissance satellite successfully lifted off from John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida and made contact with the ground station earlier this morning. Aiming to strengthen its surveillance on North Korea, Seoul plans to have five such satellites in orbit by next year. The Korean government is open to talks about the medical school admissions quota hike scheduled for the 2025 academic calendar. The Korea Medical Association will hold a joint press briefing with trainee doctors and medical students after Wednesday's general elections. Israel has pulled its ground troops out of southern Gaza, citing technical reasons. Meanwhile, Egypt is hosting new rounds of talks, aiming for a potential ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. South Korea's second military recon satellite launched this morning has successfully entered orbit and established communication with the ground station. Seoul's military reconnaissance capabilities are expected to be greatly improved following the launch. Our defense correspondent Che Min Jong is on the line with us. Min Jong, tell us about the launch. In the country's second military reconnaissance satellite lifted off at around 8.17 a.m. Korea time from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The launch follows another successful liftoff last December, and as was the case then, the satellite was carried by a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The satellite successfully entered orbit after separating from the rocket some 45 minutes after launch. It succeeded in communicating with the ground station at a second attempt at around 10.57 a.m., and this means the satellite is currently operating as planned. And Min Jong, we hear today's satellite is different from the one launched last year. Could you tell us how exactly it's different? Right. The first satellite was an EOIR satellite equipped with an electro-optical and infrared sensor. It can capture detailed images, but visibility depends on the weather and time of day. The second satellite, however, is a SAR satellite equipped with synthetic aperture radar sensors. The system captures clear images day or night, regardless of weather conditions. The EOIR satellite checks in on the Korean peninsula twice a day, but the SAR satellite does so about four to six times a day. This means the military can perform twice as many reconnaissance activities with the launch of the second satellite. I see. And Minjong, the launches are all part of the military's 425 mission. Tell us a bit more about this mission and what the main goal is there. Well, the mission's goal is to have five satellites in orbit by 2025 to boost surveillance of the Korean peninsula amid North Korea's growing nuclear and missile threats. The first satellite will be joined in orbit by four stars, and when all five operate together, the military is expected to have coverage at about two-hour intervals. Today's launch comes as North Korea also ramps up its spying activities. The North launched its first spy satellite last November and aims to launch three more this year. Observing the launch at the Defense Ministry this morning, Seoul's Defense Minister Shin won said the regime is likely to launch another in mid to late April. Despite the regime's ongoing efforts, the minister showed confidence that South Korea's military space technology is far more advanced than the North's. This is all I have for now. Back to you, Yin. Right. Thank you. That was my colleague Choi Min-jung from the Defense Ministry. Min-jung, keep us posted for any more updates. And later this week, senior defense officials from South Korea and the U.S. will meet in Washington to discuss a wide range of bilateral security issues. This is part of their latest efforts to address North Korea's evolving nuclear and missile threats. The 24th Korea-U.S. Integrated Defense Dialogue is set to take place on Thursday. The semi-annual meeting will be led by South Korea's Deputy Defense Minister for Policy, Cho chang U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, Eli Ratner, and the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Defense for East Asia, Andrew Winternitz. The two sides are expected to discuss policies to enhance cooperation for deterring North Korean threats, as well as ways to strengthen combined defense readiness. Now on to the weeks-long standoff between the government and medical personnel over the planned medical school quota hike. The medical community on Sunday said their latest meetup with President Yoon sung yeol was meaningful and that they would collectively deliver their ideas through a joint press conference later this week. In a briefing earlier today, the government said they're still open for dialogue. Yuni reports. The medical community has described last week's meeting with President Yoon sung yeol as a meaningful encounter. The head of the Korean Medical Association made an official announcement on Sunday following a three-hour discussion among medical organizations. 
The Emergency Response Committee assesses the meeting between the President and Park Dan, head of the Korean Intern and Resident Association, as meaningful. The Korean Medical Association reiterates its support for the doctors and students, urging for a unified voice. The announcement also includes plans to hold a joint press conference involving trainee doctors, medical school professors and students within this week. Earlier on Sunday, Prime Minister Han dok su addressed potential adjustments to the plan to increase medical school admissions by 2,000 places. The Prime Minister stated that the government maintains a flexible stance on all issues and is not just focused on numerical figures. Meanwhile, some universities have decided to resume classes that had been postponed due to medical students' applications for leave of absence and refusal to attend classes. Gyeongbuk National University and Jeonbuk University will resume classes starting from Monday, while Catholic University and Jeonnam National University will resume classes on the 15th. Based on the regulation that requires at least 30 weeks of lectures annually, the university said they could not delay the academic schedule any farther. Lee Eun Hee, Arirang News. On to politics. Early voting for the 22nd general election of South Korea came to an end on Saturday. According to the National Election Commission, during two days of voting, 13.8 million people, or over 31 percent of all eligible voters in the country, cast their ballots. That is the highest turnout rate for early voting in South Korea's general election history. Early voting ballot boxes are being stored under 24-hour surveillance by the NEC. They will be opened and tallied after voting ends on Wednesday. In the meantime, in the key district of Yongsan-gu in central Seoul, the rival parties are busy out on the streets greeting and encouraging people to go out and vote. Our National Assembly correspondent Lee shi reported from the site. I'm here in Yongsan-gu district, located right in the center of Seoul. To the district's south runs the Hongang River, to its north, Namsan Mountain. And this is where a fierce race is taking place right now for a seat in the National Assembly. Yongsan-gu is the third least populous of 25 districts in Seoul, with a population of roughly 227,000. But sitting across what's called the Hangang Belt, a name for key districts along the capital's main river, and housing the presidential office since the beginning of the UN administration in 2022, it's now being dubbed a new political hotspot. For this year's general election, the ruling People Power Party's Kwon young and the main opposition Democratic Party's Kang Taehyung are running against each other for the second time. Four years ago, Kwon won by just 890 votes, or 0.7 percentage points. This was the smallest margin between winning and losing candidates in a Seoul district that year. On Friday, the first day of early voting, the rival candidates went out on the streets encouraging people to vote. Kwon has served four terms in the Assembly and as Minister of Unification. He wishes to reform the area's transportation and advance a long-stalled development project to build an international business hub. Kang has worked as a civil servant mostly in Seoul for around three decades. He has served as the vice mayor one for administrative affairs of this whole metropolitan government. He hopes to relocate the presidential office and transform Yongsan Park into a full-scale ecological park. As talks on pending issues such as medical reform continue, eyes are on what the final decisions of the public will say come April 10th. Lee shi Arirang News. A senior Egyptian official has told a news channel in Cairo that the basic points of a potential deal on a ceasefire in Gaza have been agreed upon. Yunjin has the details. A state-affiliated news channel in Cairo, where truce talks on the Gaza conflict are being held, has said that all parties involved in negotiations on the basic points of a truce talk have reached an agreement. That's according to Reuters on Monday, citing a report on Egypt's al qahira News. The channel reported that delegations from both Israel and Hamas were sent to Egypt on Sunday for fresh talks on a potential ceasefire for the six-month-old conflict. According to al qahira Hamas and their mediators, the Qatari delegation, has left Cairo, but will return within two days to agree on the terms of the final agreement. Before departing from Cairo, Hamas reiterated that their demands, including a permanent ceasefire, were for the withdrawal of Israeli forces from Gaza 
and an exchange of Palestinian prisoners for Israeli hostages being held in Gaza. The ongoing truce talks coincide with the withdrawal of IDF troops from southern Gaza on Sunday. Yin Jin, Arirang News. Israel has pulled its ground troops from southern Gaza. The IDF says the war will continue after a break, while Iran warned Israel that its embassies are not safe after the deadly strike on Damascus last week. Lee seung has more. The Israeli military has withdrawn its troops from southern Gaza, citing tactical reason. The withdrawal of the troops comes after four months of fighting in Khan Yunis and coincides with the new ceasefire talks as Hamas and Israeli delegations travel to Egypt. According to Israel's defense chief Yoav Gallant, troops have withdrawn from the region and are awaiting word of their next mission. Israeli military officials also stressed that the latest move has nothing to do with a U.S. request, who have been calling on Israel to change its approach to the prolonged conflict in Gaza due to the high number of civilian casualties. They also said that the war in Gaza would continue in a different way, while Washington said it appears that Israel is seeking the rest and reorganization of its troops in southern Gaza. While the recent move signals positive momentum for ceasefire talks, tensions continue to flare between Iran and Israel. Speaking at a memorial ceremony in Tehran on Sunday for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard generals who were killed in the apparent Israeli airstrike on an Iranian consulate in Damascus last week, a military advisor to Iran's supreme leader vowed retaliation, warning that no Israeli embassy is safe from Iran. However, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said Israel was prepared for any response from Iran, while the Israel Defense Forces Chief Herzi Halevi said that the Israeli military knows how to deal with Iran both offensively and defensively. Meanwhile, tens of thousands of people continued to gather in Israel over the weekend, demanding the speedy return of the hostages taken by Hamas last October and for Netanyahu's resignation. Lee seung Arirang News. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida said that his government is making a high-level approach to North Korea for a summit with the leader Kim Jong-un. During an interview with CNN on Sunday, Kishida said the purpose of promoting a Tokyo-Pyongyang summit is to address unresolved issues and promote stable relations. The unresolved issues are interpreted to be the abduction of Japanese citizens in the 1970s and 80s and North Korea's nuclear and missile development. Kishida also said his government was monitoring military cooperation between the North and Russia and called joint military drills between Beijing and Moscow concerning with respect to international order and stability. South Korea has been celebrating April 5th as Zarbor Day since 1946 to promote the importance of trees, forests, tree planting and protecting the environment. In light of Arbor Day, our culture correspondent Song Yujin looked into what kind of efforts are being made in the cultural sector, specifically in the world of K-pop, to protect our planet Earth. Did you know that simply buying your favorite K-pop albums or streaming their music can have a big impact on the environment? According to the Environment Ministry, K-pop companies used over 800 tons of plastic for physical albums, a 14-fold increase from 2017. And it's known that streaming music for five hours online emits more carbon dioxide than one physical album coming from data centers and servers. But there's hope. The K-pop industry is going green, led by the fans. K-pop isn't just about management agencies and artists providing content. The fans play a huge role as you need a dedicated fan base to become a global star. We're seeing fans come together, speaking up about social issues, particularly when it comes to the environment. That's why I believe there's a growing awareness within the industry about these issues. One of them is K-Pop for Planet, an online platform launched in 2021 by fans to raise awareness about climate change. There's quite a diverse range of age groups among K-Pop fans, but a lot of them are in their 20s or teens like me. We're going to be the ones living through this era of climate crisis, so I think this is why many of us are recognizing that this is truly our issue and speaking out with more passion. 
For the past three years, they've been starting petitions and campaigns demanding K-pop labels to offer albums with digital download options and music streaming platforms to opt for data centers using renewable energy. Fans often buy a large quantity of albums to help their artists win year-end awards and weekly music shows. And fans of popular artists buy hundreds of albums for a chance to participate in fan sign events. Albums often include random photo cards and other merchandise, encouraging fans to buy them even more. These efforts are paying off. This company in Seoul, for example, is the first in the world to create a platform album. Unlike the thick albums we're used to, it minimizes the packaging with the majority of content accessible by scanning the QR code inside. An album usually consists of photo cards, photo books and a CD. We think it's important to balance going green with promoting the artists through this merchandise. Our goal was to use eco-friendly materials, such as paper certified by the Forest Stewardship Council for photo cards that fans love the most and upload the rest of the content online. Through these efforts, K-pop is evolving into something that not only fans, but Mother Earth can enjoy. Song Yujin, Arirang News. In South Korea, there are 100 well-maintained forests, including old-growth ones referred to as luxury forests. The Korea Forest Service is working on utilizing these luxury forests as resources for forest ecotourism to revive local economies. Chong Eun-ju with the details. This is a birch tree forest located in Wondaeri in Jeogun, Gangwon-do province. Facing severe damage from pine needle gall midges, the villagers chose to plant and nurture white birch trees, which grow quickly for over 50 years. Now it has transformed into a representative winter tourism resource, attracting 300,000 visitors annually and serves as a solid support for the local economy. Rural areas are aging, right? I believe the birch forests are playing a role in shifting the economic base from agriculture to a new industry. The top 100 luxury forests were selected by gathering public opinion from 2017 to 2023 among national, private and locally managed forests. The list includes 29 forests created through reforestation and forest cultivation, such as the Hinoki Cypress Forest in Gochangup, Jeollabukdo Province, and the Korean Pine Forest in Yangpyeonggun, Gyeonggi-do Province. There are also 45 forests suitable for leisure activities, such as the White Birch Forest in Injegun, Gangwon-do Province, and the Healing Forest in Sogipo, Jeju Island. 26 forests with valuable conservation needs are on the list as well, such as Gumbaeryeong in Injagun, Gangwon-do province and Gwangneung forest in Pocheon, Gyeonggi-do province. Projects are underway to revive endangered areas using forests. The project aims to develop forest ecology programs centered around luxury forests and utilize them as tourism resources. The white birch forest in Inje attracts 300,000 visitors annually, and its ripple effect on the local economy amounts to 33.6 billion won annually. Each luxury forest demonstrates that it can be an important resource for reviving endangered areas. The UN has proposed promoting the livelihoods of residents as a strategy for taking care of the forests. Jung Eun-ju, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. The Russian government has declared a federal emergency in the country's southern Orenburg region amid rising water levels in the Ural River. Some of the biggest floods in decades have hit Russian regions in the Ural Mountains and Siberia, as well as parts of Kazakhstan over the past few days. The Orenburg Regional Government has evacuated more than 4,000 people, including 885 children in the city of Orsk, as the Ural River flooded at least 6,000 homes in the region. Europe's third longest river burst through a dam embankment in Orsk on Friday, after meltwater rose the water levels. Local officials said the dam in Orsk was built to hold a water level of 5.5 metres, but the Ural River rose to 9.6 metres. Orenburg's regional governor said that flooding had been recorded along the entire course of the Ural River. Kazakhstan's president said on Saturday 
that the floods were the country's largest natural disaster in 80 years. A Soyuz space capsule carrying American, Belarusian and Russian crew members successfully touched down in Kazakhstan on Saturday. The three returned to Earth after finishing their mission on the International Space Station. NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara returned to Earth after 204 days on the ISS, alongside veteran Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky and spaceflight participant Marina Vasilevskaya. The Soyuz M24 capsule took about three and a half hours to travel from the International Space Station back to Earth. Despite the geopolitical tensions due to the war in Ukraine, space is one of the last remaining areas of cooperation between the U.S. and Russia. Now to the U.S., where two people were killed and seven, including a police officer, were wounded in a shootout at a bar in Doral, Florida. Local police reported that the shootout, which took place early on Saturday local time, followed an argument where one suspect pulled out a gun and killed the security guard who was trying to respond. Six bystanders were also shot, while one police officer was hit in the leg. According to reports, two of the injured are in critical condition. Active investigations by the city of Doral Police, the Miami Police and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement are currently underway. Staying in the U.S. and to Oregon, where one lucky lotto player is set to take home a $1.3 billion Powerball prize early Sunday morning local time. After an unexpected delay of three and a half hours, the winning numbers announced were 22, 27, 44, 52 and 69, with 9 as the Powerball number. The winner overcame odds of 1 in 292 million to claim the jackpot. The all-time biggest Powerball jackpot of $2.04 billion was won in California in November 2022. Kim Jiang, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Major cherry blossom spots in the capital area were crowded over the weekend with tourists and residents enjoying the full bloom. The weather was also quite warm, almost early summer-like weather on Sunday under bright skies. And we are having another warm afternoon in most places after a breezy start. Western parts of the country, however, are dealing with bad dust levels, while the capital area remains under a dry weather advisory. Humidity in Seoul could go down to as low as 20% by the late afternoon, which is 30% lower than the ideal level. So please try to stay hydrated. Partly sunny to cloudy skies are expected in most parts of the country with rain in the forecast for Jeju in the afternoon. And Seoul and Daejeon will go up to 23 degrees Celsius, Busan topping out at 21 degrees Celsius. It will stay dry through this week with more roller coaster temperatures between lows and highs. Waking up to single digit morning temperatures on General Election Day on Wednesday. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. That's all we have for you at this hour. We'll bring you more updates at the same time tomorrow.